would now like to invite our next speaker, which is Dr. Tarsh Te Kaikera. I hope I pronounced it right. He is trustee of the Shola Trust and director of the Real Elephant Collective. Tarsh is a researcher, conservationist, and interested in more human inclusive models of nature conservation. He has a PhD from British Open University and an MSc from University of Oxford. He researches in various areas including work of Lantana Kamara, mapping it in Udumalai, Bandipur and Vainad, while also looking how communities can use the plants in various ways. So his topic for today's discussion is coexistence and globe-trotting Lantana elephants. Please welcome Tarsh on stage. Uh, thank you, Mimi, and uh, everyone here for this uh, really interesting set of uh, speakers and a very interesting uh, and diverse audience. Uh, first up, I don't know uh, uh, Mr. Parthasathi, I'm afraid, so unlike all the very senior stalwarts in this audience, uh, we're coming at it from a very different place. Uh, second, uh, lots of my colleagues here in this session are all talking about elephants, that is the real elephants. Uh, my PhD was about how elephants and people are sharing space, but I'm going to move it a little along the line and talk about uh, a different kind of elephants, the lantana elephants. So my talk is going to be more about lantana and indigenous livelihoods uh, rather than elephants because that's come up quite a bit. So quickly where we work, um, there's the BR Hills or the BRT Tiger Reserve, Bandipur, Mudumalai uh, and Gudlur. Um, so it's a lot of in the parks trying to remove lantana but creating use for communities who live outside the parks or in the case of Bandipur communities who were removed from the parks for no good reason about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so it's to primarily create more livelihood for local people and create some benefits from the park for them. Uh, about lantana, I think most people will know about it. It's a terrible invasive shrub that's taking over forests. It contains toxins that don't allow it to be eaten by animals. Uh, it completely takes over the forest. It puts out uh, allelopathic chemicals. It suppresses the growth of all other plants. So once lantana takes over, it's only lantana. It grow really tall. That's an elephant there, smothered in lantana, and that's a person as well, smothered in lantana there. Um, and quick, some background research. Just a quick takeaway from this whole slide. This was a paper we published in 2012. It's not a new problem. The first eradication plan for lantana was in the forests of Kurg and Benne in Mudumalai in 1906. Right? So the British have been trying to eradicate it for over a hundred years with no success. So clearly this approach of just go cutting the plant, cutting the plant, cutting the plant is not working and we need to change gears quite drastically in the way we approach this. Uh, the other is that the scale of the plant, this is again from the same paper, this was an ecological niche model. It's a huge problem across the world, it's not just India, it's one of the top six invasive plants in the world now. Australia is spending huge amounts of money developing specialized pesticides herbicides, sorry, that they spray that only kill lantana, nothing else, but it still isn't really working in pushing the plant back. All across Africa, it's a problem. Other than its native Americas, it's a problem everywhere. Uh, in India as well, it's a huge problem. This is a paper from uh, Ninad Mungi and others at Wildlife Institute of India. I'll just highlight that one number there. 160,000 crores. It sounds like one of these 2G scam type of things, right? So the amount of money you have to spend is totally not reasonable. It's not like any CAMPA funds, any CSR, any anything can actually be put aside to clear lantana. So it's not going to happen. We cannot put money and remove lantana. Uh, the next is, in the South Indian parks, we uh, mapped lantana across most of its range. We walked around every square kilometer of all these parks and we found about 40% of the parks are dense lantana where almost nothing else is growing. So this is a huge problem, almost that much land area in these parks is unavailable, pushing elephants and a range of other animals out, right? It's also causing increased conflicts, difficult to study this very uh, systematically, but I'll maybe talk about that later if people are interested. But it is a huge problem. So just quickly on Mudumalai, say one park where we work a lot, there are about 30,000 hectares of dense lantana and the government removes about 30 hectares every year. Now they've got massive NTCA funding of 2-3 crores, so they remove 100 or 200 hectares. But 100 or 200 hectares and 30,000 hectares are two orders of magnitude out. So again, this approach of we will pay money to cut patches of lantana is really useless. So what we've been trying to do is create a whole value chain around it, uh, I'll basically revolving around indigenous livelihoods. You can use the stems to make furniture, crafts and other things, but more importantly, you have to shred the whole plant and get it out, which is what I'll be talking about a little more. 
the lantana elephants, uh, I, I don't know if people have come across these, but uh, they are all replicas of real wild elephants that uh, live in the Nilgiris. They are travelling around the world telling stories of how people in India are coexisting with elephants and calling people in other places to live better with wolves or beavers or badgers or other small seemingly insignificant animals from an Indian context that they seemingly struggle with so much. Wolves are apparently making a huge comeback across Europe and people are really scared. But we have wolves in India but nobody cares about them because we have to deal with elephants, leopards, tigers, uh, a range of much bigger species. So the elephants are really talking about coexistence around the world and trying to flip this uh, very colonial conservation agenda of the global north telling the global south what to do. We are trying to reverse that a little bit. Um, so this came out of my PhD, um, like Nishant, uh, we started much later, he's done a lot more work in this area on identifying individuals and understanding individual behavior and personality, that was a big chunk of my PhD. So we had uh, all the elephants in Goodlur, we knew them quite well, uh, based on that these drawings were made, we had worked with the forest department to identify individuals, um, and yeah, each elephant is a replica of it. They were outside Buckingham Palace, uh, they have been in mul multiple places, they were basically finally auctioned and sold in the royal parks in uh, the UK last year and raised uh, 250, 25 crores, 2.5 million pounds which is now a coexistence fund, I, I think many people in this room may have applied to it as well, they put out calls for people to um, apply for money if they want to. Coexistence is a very complicated term. It doesn't mean animals can go everywhere and give rural people a real battering. I'll leave you all to look at this website. It's a coexistenceconsortium.com. I think the bottom part, acceptable to local communities where the risks are kept within tolerable levels, which is determined based on the local context, right? Coexistence is about living well with nature, but not letting animals just give people a real bashing everywhere and people put up with it indefinitely. It's about balancing those and making sure people are okay with it. Um, so a lot of the funds from the Lantana elephants came to the Coexistence Consortium and we set up a, um, a program, a fellowship program for young people across India to study coexistence better. So coming back to Lantana now, so the, the elephants to be honest haven't really removed much Lantana from the forest, right? So we're looking at all the other uses I talked about in that slide, those are some prototypes we made for the airport uh, lights. That's a lantana and plastic, recycled plastic composite. You can make pesticides from lantana. Lots of things are possible. I'll quickly go through these just to show all images. These are prefab uh, panels we made during COVID to start off with to put up isolation wards very quickly. But they can also be used in more high-end construction, almost very quick constructions. Prefabricated, come in, wattle and daub. It's a technique used internationally. Uh, and you can build walls very quickly with it. But perhaps the most important is this whole biochar. So if you shred the lantana, you can then convert it into charcoal and put it back into the soil to improve agriculture. Uh, this is something that we talked about a lot, AME Foundation. This would be quite interesting if you could partner with them. So you're burying carbon back into the ground, providing indigenous people livelihood and removing lantana from the forest to create better habitat for a range of animals. Uh, so the problem is it's not straightforward. The plant is very bulky. If you take, think people are going to cut head loads out and come, it's just not going to happen. Um, you need to make, mechanize the process to some extent. The policy space is not very clear. Like are people allowed to take lantana out at scale has not been clear. From 2012, we suggested it in our paper. And finally, 2019-20, governments are starting to allow this. Um, but it's a bit tricky. If you allow the private industry into forest to remove lantana, there needs to be a lot of checks and balances. So we've been developing uh, machines which are ecologically appropriate. So primarily it's winches. So people go tie all the base of the pl lantana plants and in one pull you pull out quarter and a hectare of lantana uh, with a tractor based winch and looking at these four wheel drive jeeps that are already used in the forest. So this isn't kind of alien vehicles you're introducing, vehicles that are already there. Um, we need to scale up, I won't, I'll just leave this out there, but basically each individual unit, right, will work in different parts. So your impact is not going to be huge on the ground. It's going to be a lot of small little people working in different places, little units. One lantana removal unit is about eight uh, indigenous people with one set of machines. That has to be aggregated and then it can be used for lots of things. Thing is, every industry buys a huge amount of biomass, but they need 50 tons a day, 40 tons a day. One group of people will only get five tons a day maximum. So you have to aggregate and start working at scale for it to be uh, effective. Um, and yeah, then the general advertising about all the great benefits of this, uh, it benefits local communities, conservation, the consumer, there is of course sustainable development goals, more than half of the sustainable development goals are covered if we are able to implement this uh, in multiple parks at scale. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly wind up, there's lots of text there, leave it. So one big challenge though is that 
um, how do you estimate how much lantana there is? Like if they are giving it out to contractors and the contractors may be scamming everybody, right? You choose a big patch, show lots of lantanas, but when you do a drone shot, you find there may be big open areas behind. So to measure the amount of lantana there is, we are trying to use drones and things like that. And uh, to make sure they don't cut the trees and pulverize those also, right? You, that will take up your biomass figure per hectare drastically. So we are looking at using drones quite significantly to process all of this and also monitor what is coming back. Invariably after you take out lantana what comes back is more lantana or uh, in what people think is a better scenario it is chromolina odorata which is another invasive unpalatable weed. So bringing back grasses is vital using traditional fire uh, communities across South India have used fire to manage grasslands that is vital. Uh, so we are looking at yeah these are just a couple of images from different parks that is it for now thank you. There is a video which I hope Mimi will share later that shows this process because I think a lot of people when you say machines in forests are worried and we are worried too. So we are trying to make sure we have all the checks and balances ourselves and we see machines as almost a necessary evil, they are not a solution in themselves. Uh, but there will be a point when there aren't local people who want to do this work on large scale and so machines will have to take over. Thanks. Thank you Tarsh. I mean you know it was, it was actually wonderful meeting Tarsh and uh, we have the, uh, you know he was very kind enough to bring two of the Lantana elephants to our place to show my mother because she wouldn't be able to be here. But you know, I think, you know, you were telling me a very important issue, the root cause of this problem of Lantana and the burning issue that you, you know, brought about and the, the concept that, you know, right from eons, you know, we were burning a certain portion of the, of, uh, of the land and of the forest area at various periods of time so that this invasive problem would not happen and there would be a fresh, uh, you know, growth of uh, the undergrowth that would come in. Could you just throw some light on that? Because, and what is the issue that stands to, uh, you know, stopping that for us to do it? Because, you know, you pull something out, it's going to grow back, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, this is a very long and complicated question that goes back to history, uh, politics, uh, all kinds of things. But very briefly, after independence, India made a concerted effort to move away from the British and German forestry practices that we were used to, which was all about sustainable forestry, using things well. In 1969, we hosted the World Parks Congress and we moved towards North America to cut ties with our previous uh, rulers, right? But in that, we changed our conservation paradigm significantly from thinking of the forest as a sustainable use space to this whole preservationist idea. And there, this no fire and no human intervention was a vital part of management. But that is not necessarily the best. If a place has been managed for 40,000 years in a particular way by local communities, the baseline for that space includes what the local communities did. There's a very interesting paper from Dr. Sukuma's lab on fire. So they'll analyze fire across South India. When do these big devastating fires happen? For that to happen, a certain set of variables have to come together. Very high wind speed to carry the fire, very low humidity in the air, uh, very high ambient temperature and large flammable biomass. When these four come together, almost always there is a devastating fire in South India. Now, if you look at these four, the only thing that we humans can control, we can't control temperature and kind of global climate processes, we can control the amount of flammable biomass there is. Right? And for the soligas or the katanaikins, like a human needs a haircut, a forest needs a fire to clear out the biomass at the bottom. The soligas burn very carefully early season, January, February, when the other factors are not in place. So they have what they call taragubenki, which just burns the ground and the litter and clears the forest out, allowing for new growth. And in peak summer also, you will see there is always one summer monsoon, some summer rain. And if you do burn, you have a fresh amount of grass that comes up that is very good forage for the animals and keeps lots of uh, pathogens and invasive species at bay. So for all the local people, India banned fire in the Wildlife Protection Act. But actually on the ground, they kept burning themselves until they set up this very high tech monitoring system from the central government, that satellite based uh, system that monitors fires. And every time there is a fire in a park, from the forest minister to the forest secretary to the chief wildlife warden to everybody, they get an SMS on their phone. That's when they actually stopped the burning completely because before they would, uh, around their camps and inside the forest, they would burn quietly. Finally, all the forest department staff are still Adivasi people from those landscapes. If they're living in a camp that's completely surrounded by forests, uh, it's a big risk for them. So they would burn. But that system actually then uh, put a complete close on fire. And I think that's why we've seen an accelerated rate of Lantana coming up. This is not verified, of course, it's not studied scientifically. But that's the only thing that seems to correspond in terms of a significant change that happened in the early 2000s that's led to the sudden spread of Lantana much more. Sorry, so, that was a long you know, I know, I question. think it's a very, I mean, the reason is that this is the root 
problem that is, just, that is sitting. And I think my daughter Hamsini is going to be addressing that issue in your presentation. Whatever you're talking about in terms of, uh, you know, the solar gas, because you have Atri and, you know, all the main, main uh, uh, people from there and talking about this issue. So now when it came, I mean, you were also talking about how uh, the, the process of now trying to manage taking out this lantana from the, from the forest. I mean, that's going to be causing a different set of uh, challenges for you, isn't it? Yeah, so the key is, um, it's going to be a slow process. A standard question everybody asks is if this is an invasive, you want it removed, what if you succeed? You remove the invasive, what happens to these hundreds of people who are going to be working? Uh, so the answer is that it's going to take 50 years to remove. If there are 500 people working in every park, steadily, it'll take, in the next 50 years, they will clear the lantana. And my worry is, much before that, there will be nobody willing to work in this kind of backbreaking manual labor in a forest. So, uh, it is a slow process. From an ecological perspective, any disturbance you create, creates space for weeds. So, when you create a disturbance, you have to be very careful about that disturbance. You do not want a large-scale JCB kind of approach of a whole lot of diggers go in and clear out the forest of Lantana. It has to be a slow process with space and time for recovery as you move along. So it will be a very small, slow incremental process, but it's setting in place a system and process that's going to push back against a 200 year old, year old problem uh, and a hundred, 100 years of intensive management of forest departments cutting, cutting, cutting lantana. So yeah, it's a long and slow... When you, when you uh, pull it out that uh, the will fall down, right? Yeah, yeah. The, it will definitely fall and it will definitely sprout and you have to uproot it the next year. So it doesn't have to fall down. The soil is full of se seeds already. The seed yeah. bank is full in the soil. And Burning bird, helps. Bird, birds also spread it very much. Yeah, because birds help. Having a sweet, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've heard this a lot as well. Bulbuls have adapted very well to Lantana and uh, they're doing very well. Uh, what happens then to bulbuls? And I say they're going to suffer. It's an unfortunate truth, but bulbul populations are going to go down. But we have to decide, have we declared bulbul reserves across South India or these tiger reserves for a range of mammals? So it's inevitable that there are going to be trade-offs. Some of number of bulbuls are going to come down. There's an un unnaturally high density of bulbuls, I would say, in all tiger reserves. That is going to happen. So there will be a trade-off, not just bulbuls. I'm oversimplifying here. That there are certain species that have butterflies in particular, insects maybe, that have adapted to lantana. But it's, a, it's balancing the costs and benefits of Lantana overall. I think there needs to be some intervention quite drastically. And let me just ask you your, the last question because there was this conversation that you and I had that because of this Lantana overgrowth, you were saying some 450,000 hectares or some uh, very large number yeah. in, in all our South Indian forests. Is that possibly the reason why we are having many of the wild animals, or the whatever, I mean, because it's, it's uh, fodder for all of them? coming out into out Ab of the absolutely. forest? Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, again, a group of us tried to come up with a systematic experiment to measure this, and we couldn't because you have to find an area without lantana and lots of too many kind of confounding variables for it to be a robust experiment. Uh, but just logically, uh, it definitely has an impact. I mean, that much land in our prime habitats or what we call tiger reserves, highest protection status, most amount of money being spent is taken over by invasive wheat that nothing can eat. So it is definitely that much land is unavailable. So for smaller bodied mammals, I think they, the numbers will fall. Uh, they, they will be like more predation by tigers and whatever, your density will fall. But for elephants, they're not going to fall. They're going to move out. So I think for elephants, definitely there is this push and pull that is happening. There's a push out of reserves uh, by Lantana and unpalatable. There's Senna spectabilis, another invasive that's taking over the wetter forests. So these are pushing them out. And you have irrigated nice crop fields all along the edges, which are pulling them out, right? So this push-pull is vital in uh, what is driving the increase in conflict and it's something we definitely need to address. Thank you so much, Tash. Thank you. This seems to be a very big issue and which needs constant attention.